Welcome to the Word of God. This is an introduction to the books of the prophets. To listen to these books, go to the playlists entitled, where each chapter is individually recorded for free downloading. For direct access, answer the particular book, Isaiah for example, at Christendo. Thank you. This introduction may be found by searching the prophets at Christendo. Now then, throughout the Bible, God communicates with the people he has created. That communication always has a purpose and calls for action. Sometimes God speaks directly to a particular person with a promise or a warning. Sometimes the hearer is told to take a message to another person or to other people. It is clear that God can speak directly to any person, but he often uses his own delivery service. God's messengers are described in various ways, e.g. Man of God, 1 Kings 13.1, 1 Samuel 9.9, 2 Samuel 24.11. And the terminology certainly varied in different periods of history, but the most common word in the Bible to describe a messenger of God is a prophet or prophetess. The word can describe the plain fact someone really has a message from God, or what appears to be so, someone purports to give a message from God. In early times, the word prophet probably referred mostly to people who exhibited rather wild behaviour, which was attributed to the Spirit of God. See especially Numbers 11, 26 to 30, and 1 Samuel 10, 9 to 11, 19, 20 to 24. As time went on, the people of Israel came to understand that outward displays of inexplicable behaviour were of minimal importance. What mattered was whether a prophet had, or had not, in Jeremiah's words, stood in the counsel of the Lord. Jeremiah 23, 18-22 The ideal prophet was one who spoke with God face to face, as Moses did, see Numbers 12, 6-8, and compare Deuteronomy 18, 15-22. From the Old Testament stories about prophets and leaders, the hallmarks of a true prophet were a call from God. We have accounts of how some of the great prophets were called. Moses, Exodus 3, 1, 4 to 17. I beg your pardon. Exodus 3, 1 to chapter 4, 17. Samuel in 1 Samuel 3. Isaiah and Isaiah 6, Amos 7, verses 10 to 15, Hosea 1, 2, though here we have not a typical case, Jeremiah in 1, verses 4 to 10, and Ezekiel chapters 1 to 3. This must have been of decisive importance for them, though we cannot say that all prophets received such a definite call. Some seem to have belonged to prophetic schools, as with the band or company of prophets in 1 Samuel 10.10 10 and 19.20, or the sons of the prophets mentioned in connection with Elijah and Elisha, see 2 Kings 2. Some other important leaders also received direct calls from God. Abraham in Genesis 12, verses 1 to 3, a call that was later confirmed and expanded. Joshua, see especially Joshua chapter 1. Gideon in Judges 6, 1, 6, 11, and the chapters thereafter. Samson via his parents in Judges 13. It is not clear whether the early prophets majored on this aspect. No message is mentioned in the cases of Moses, the 70 elders who prophesied in Numbers 11, or the band that met Saul. This is in Samuel 1.10 verses 5-7. to When Samuel anointed Saul as king of Israel, he said to him, 
The Spirit of the Lord will come on you in power and you will prophesy with the procession of prophets coming down from the high places and you will be changed into a different person. Then do whatever your hand finds to do, for God is with you. For the rest, however, it is clear that the message is what makes a prophet a prophet. The means of receiving it may vary, voice, vision, dream, and the method of passing it on may vary. Proclamation at the sanctuary or temple, speaking face to face with an individual, or acting out the message, as in Isaiah 20 and Jeremiah 19. The important factor is that the message is from God. Prophets are expected not only to speak to people on behalf of God, but to speak to God on behalf of the people. See especially Exodus 32, verses 11 to 14, and chapters 30 to 32, who Moses offers to be punished instead of the Israelites, who have made a golden calf. Compare Genesis 27, where Abraham has the prayer ministry of a prophet and Jeremiah 15.1. Not all those who claimed to be prophets were truly God's messengers. How were God's people to tell the difference? In Deuteronomy 13, the false prophet is one who calls people away after other gods and speaks rebellion against the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt to make you leave the way in which the Lord your God commanded you to walk. Quote, when, when this prophet's words are tested against what is already recognised as the truth of or about God, they fail. A second test is the test of time. If a prophet speaks for God, what he says comes to pass. The, prophet's, the false prophet's message fails this test also. Israel was founded on God's promise to Abraham. They enjoyed a special covenant relationship with him through Isaac, and that entailed weighty responsibilities. Israel was expected to be faithful to the Lord God only, and to fashion their lives according to the instructions, the law, that God himself had given. Before Isaac was born, the covenant was with Abraham and through the Hebrews, through the Israelites. God made it clear unto the people that it was through Isaac that the covenant of God himself with his people would be through Isaac. Indeed, Ishmael was to be blessed and to be made a ruler of nations, but he was not to enter into covenant with the Lord and his chosen people. Right from the beginning, however, Israel proved to be rather poor at keeping their side of the covenant and incapable of hearing what God had to say. God therefore sent a series of prophets to remind them of what he had done for them and of their proper response, to warn them of the consequences of disobeying God, the almighty and only true God, and to exhort them to return to him. Prophets also had a more positive role, to encourage the people in times of suffering, deserved or undeserved, to offer them forgiveness when they had sinned, and to renew the covenant promises made with their ancestors. Most significantly, the prophets point forward to the time when God will intervene decisively in the life of the nation by sending his own special representative. The Old Testament refers to this person as King, Son of David, 2 Samuel 7.12, Isaiah 9.7, Zechariah 9.9, Compare Micah 5.2, Servant of the Lord in the book of Isaiah, 
The righteous branch in the book of Jeremiah, see 23 verses 5 to 6, and Zechariah 3 verse 8 and 6 verse 12, Son of Man in Daniel. An ordinary title in itself, simply meaning human being, but very significant in the way it is used here and in the Gospels, and so on. The New Testament calls this person the Messiah, the Christ, the Anointed One, and Christians from the time of Jesus until now have been enriched by their study of the pictures that the prophets present to us. Firstly, that God is the ruler of all history. The prophets took this so seriously that they were prepared to risk depicting the mighty empires of their day as tools in the hand of God. See Isaiah 10 verses 5 to 15. This constitutes a problem for Habakkuk. How could the Holy God use unholy, corrupt instruments? The answer the Bible offers is to reaffirm God's sovereign control of the world, a control so intricately exercised that people who do not own him act responsibly according to the dictates and pressures of their own natures. But God, the just and holy ruler, nonetheless presides, governs and guides over all. See 2 Kings 19, chapters 25, 28, Ezekiel 38, verses 3 to 4, 10 to 11, and chapter 16, 39, verses 2 to 3. Apologies if some of the number crunching is incorrect, but you will find in 2 Kings all that you are seeking. Then the need to get right with God, for both the community and the individual, to get right with God is what matters most. See Isaiah 30, verse 15. God is always at work to bring his people back to himself. Amos, chapter 4, verses 6 to 11. The prophet summons men and women to personal readiness to meet with God. Amos 4, verse 12. Then religion and right action. There is no place for religion without right living, both on the personal level and in terms of social justice. See Jeremiah chapter 7 verses 1 to 15. To be right with God, men and women must live in obedience to God's standards and commands, and this produces a sound society. If people are alienated from God, their relationships with one another will go awry. Compare Amos 2 verses 7 to 8 with 9 to 12. Then there is judgment and hope. According to the prophet's analysis of the current situation, God's judgment is inevitable. Yet hope shafts through the darkest clouds. See Isaiah 6 13, 28 5. 29.5 and 31.5 and Amos 9.1. This blend of darkness and light, judgment and hope, springs directly from the character of God himself. God, the just and holy judge. God, the ever-loving, ever-merciful. And then the messianic kingdom. God has a bright future state in store for his people. It is seen as the setting up of the perfect covenant relationship. Isaiah 54.10, Jeremiah 31, verses 31 to 34, and Ezekiel 37, verses 26 to 27. And it is centred upon that great coming person already described above. The Christ. And of course the New Testament informs us that all the prophets and the Psalms prophesy and proclaim the coming of the Messiah, the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, to be born in Bethlehem. And ending with Revelation, 
in the second coming of the ascended Son of God, God of very God, Jesus Christ when he comes in power and glory. End of introduction to the prophets. <laughs>